In this video, we will introduce ourselves to the concept of skeletal muscle relaxants. Broadly speaking, skeletal muscle relaxants can be classified into centrally acting, peripherally acting and directly acting. Centrally acting skeletal muscle relaxants are used in the management of spasticity from upper motor neuron syndromes and also in the management of muscular pain or spasms from peripheral musculoskeletal conditions. Examples of such centrally acting skeletal muscle relaxants include baclofen, tizanidine, chlorzoxazone and many more. Directly acting skeletal muscle relaxants are also used in the treatment of spasticity from upper motor neuron syndromes for the management of malignant hyperthermia and met the management of neuroleptic malignant syndrome. A classical example of a directly acting skeletal muscle relaxant would be dantrolene. Now, moving forward in this discussion, we shall be talking exclusively about peripherally acting skeletal muscle relaxants. Peripherally acting skeletal muscle relaxants are also called neuromuscular blocking agents. We need to understand very clearly, especially for beginners, that neuromuscular blocking agents are not used for spasticity from upper motor neuron syndromes or for muscular pain or spasms. And if that is true, then what are neuromuscular blocking agents used for? And to understand the role of neuromuscular blocking agents, otherwise called peripherally acting skeletal muscle relaxants, we need to have a clear idea about the concept of general anesthesia. Now the state of general anesthesia is said to be achieved when five components are present and they include amnesia, mobility, decrease in autonomic reflexes in response to pain, analgesia and loss of consciousness. It is possible to produce all five of these components in a patient using a single general anesthetic agent. However, very high doses would be required and this would lead to profound hemodynamic depression and possibly death of the patient. The aim should obviously be to achieve all the components of general anesthesia state without producing excessive hemodynamic suppression and danger to the life of the patient. This is possible by using a combination of drugs instead of a single general anesthetic agent. For example, to achieve all five components, we would combine the general anesthetic agent with neuromuscular blocking agents to produce uh, good immobility, with opioid analgesics to produce analgesia, and with other drugs. So, neuromuscular blocking agents are not used for the usual aches and pains or for spasticity or such conditions. These are drugs which are used to produce a state of complete and total immobility. Even the muscles of respiration including the diaphragm will stop functioning. The patient will not move even if he or she is operated upon and such a patient would have to be mechanically ventilated. Thus, neuromuscular blocking agents are used when complete and total immobility is required to perform a surgery or any other unpleasant but necessary procedure on the patient. Neuromuscular blocking agents or peripherally acting skeletal muscle relaxants may be classified into two, namely the depolarizing agents and the non-depolarizing agents. The depolarizing agents are partial agonists of the NM receptors, the nicotinic receptors. There is only one example for a depolarizing agent and that is succinylcholine, also called scoline or succinethonium. Non-depolarizing agents are antagonists at the NM receptor. They are competitive antagonists 
of acetylcholine at the NM receptor or in other words they are concentration dependent antagonists of acetylcholine at the NM receptor and there are many examples for this group of drugs. So although succinylcholine is considered as an as a partial agonist at the NM receptors classically we do not include it as a cholinergic drug. It is true that it is an agonist at, at a, a partial agonist at least at the NM receptor but we do not speak of it as a cholinergic drug. Similarly non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents are anticholinergic since they block the effect of acetylcholine at the NM receptors in a competitive manner. So they are anti-nicotinic, but when we discuss anticholinergic drugs, we usually stress on the anti-muscarinic drugs. Now to understand how neuromuscular blocking agents work, we need to understand how excitation contraction coupling occurs in a normal skeletal muscle. We will discuss this in subsequent videos.